psalmist says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. O oh my soul. Well, let's bless the name of the Lord together now by singing number 196 in our blue hymn books. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. 196. Well, as you sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. 
Our gracious God and Father, we bow gladly in your presence this morning with hearts full of praise. For you are the Lord Almighty of both earth and heaven. Your throne is established in the heavens. All that is made, all of this world that is seen and all that is unseen, it's all under your sovereign rule. You are the King of creation who above all things so mightily reigns and there is no other but you. And we come this morning into your presence seeking your face, O King of kings, for you are the one who keeps us safe at your side. You alone are our health and salvation. We marvel at the way in which you so gently sustain us. By your marvelous providence, you've provided for all of our needs, given us life and breath, given us so much to bless us in this world that we do not deserve. And Father, we ask that this morning you would draw near to us and speak your word of truth to us. We confess that we are so weak and often our hearts are cast down within us. Often we feel that darkness and sin are abounding around us and within us. So Father, please let your holy word break forth as light in our hearts and scatters the terrors of night. Surround us with your great and abundant mercy and enable us, your precious children in Christ, to be a fruit that will last, fruit that will bring the name of Jesus much glory, honor, and praise for all eternity. Oh, how we need you, Lord, to keep us walking in your truth to keep us living lives of penitence, to keep us serving your kingdom. Father, we, we know so easily how our hearts and wills are prone to wander, prone to leave you, the God that we love. So we ask that you will keep us from the selfishness of anti-love, from promoting ourselves rather than promoting Christ. And help us, your beloved children, to love one another as Christ has loved us with the great costly love of the cross. So guard us, Heavenly Father, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, let me welcome you all once again to the service here this morning. Those of you upstairs and those of you downstairs, hopefully you can see me on the screens. And uh, especially if you're visiting, I see a few faces, a few visitors who uh, may be here on holiday. It's great to see you as well. We hope that you feel at home with us. Please let me draw your attention to these notice sheets. You should have received one of these as you came in, found it on your chair. These contain all that you need to know about the goings on in the life of our church over the rest of the week. You'll see in the front page details about the rest of our services today. Do join us this evening at 6.30 at our Kelvin Grove building where we meet for our evening service and we continue our series in Esther together. And then inside you'll see there details about our children's ministries and our creches and so forth. And then midweek ministries, let me draw your attention to Wednesday evening where we have our small groups meeting here at 7.30. If you want to know more about that and come along and join a small group, then you can email Paul Brennan. His email address is there on the sheet. Then you'll see on the back page, just do have a look at these extra notices. Some very important things there. Um, you've only got a few more days to get booked up to our West of Scotland Gospel Partnership. This is a great and wonderful uh, event that's coming up for everyone who wants to see the church grow. And of course, that should be all of us, shouldn't it? So um, if you want to get booked up to that, then don't miss out because uh, it closes on Wednesday. Then if you want to be a member, if you've been worshipping with us for quite some time and you want to stop being just a passenger in church and step up to be an active gospel partner, then uh, why don't you email Tron Central, uh, email the church office and uh, you'll find out more details about the membership classes that are coming up soon. And then just notice there there's some more road closures next Sunday, so perhaps you're going to have to change your regular route into church and go a different way, um, but hopefully not. Last notice is that the Christian Institute 
are inviting us this week to take part in a special week of prayer where we pray for specific issues and things that are affecting our society, our schools, our families and our government. Um, I'm sure most of you are signed up to the Christian Institute website and if you are then you will know all there is to know about this but if you haven't and you want to pray this week it starts today then do grab one of these they're available at the reception desk uh, as soon as you leave on your way out this morning well those are our notices and so we come now to our bible reading and you'll find that at the end of the new testament in john's third letter three john that's on page 1026 of our church Bibles. We're delighted to have Terry McCutcheon here, the Executive Director of Hope for Glasgow. I can always tell when Terry's going to preach because the lectern is just a wee bit lower <laughs> than what it is for when Willie preaches. So <laughs> there you go. But great. Terry, we're delighted that you're here. And Terry's going to take us through this sh short but crucial letter. So, 3 John. And we begin reading at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth. As indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love for the church, before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that they may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come... I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Peace be with you. The friends greet you, greet the friends, every one of them. Well, amen, and may God bless to us this, his word. Well, we're going to sing again now a hymn that reminds us of our great calling as a church. Number 630, we all are one in mission, 630. Thank you. 
Well, our offering for the Lord's work will now be collected, and perhaps you'd like to use the time wisely by looking back over those verses that we read, or perhaps pray for someone that you know is in need in this, at this time. Our offering will now be collected. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray again. Our God and Heavenly Father, you are the sovereign Lord. You work all things according to the counsel of your will. So we bring our prayers to you now. And we pray for our world that's so needy, so broken, so clearly in bondage to decay. And it's all because of mankind's decision to spurn your word of truth. We only have to look at the news headlines to be given a sobering reminder of the evil that we are all capable of in our hearts. So, Father, have mercy, we pray. We pray for the governing authorities all over the world, those whom you have established and set up to rule over the nations, we ask that they would not abuse their positions of power and instead they would rule justly and truthfully. We pray especially for our Prime Minister and her government. Help them to resist any temptation to put themselves first. Instead, we ask that the members of our government will only seek to do what is best for the country and for the people. And may they restrain evil in this land and only put in places policies and laws that will bring about goodness. But Father, we know that ultimately we can never cast our hopes upon politicians, upon the kingdoms and the rulers of this world. We know that ultimately the only thing that will save our nation and all of the nations is the gospel of your son, Christ Jesus. And so we pray for your church, our precious brothers and sisters in Christ, the little local churches who hold fast to the truth that are scattered over the face of the globe. We lift them up before you now. We pray that all may go well with them, that they may be in good health, both physically and above all, spiritually. 
Father, help your children to be walking in the truth so that they will live in ways that are distinctly different to the dark and unbelieving societies that surround them. So that those outside of Christ may look upon your people and testify that your people are so wonderfully different in the way that they seek to outdo one another with hospitality and kindness and love. And so therefore, may their eyes be turned to the Lord of the church. We're conscious of just how selfish and puffed up the human heart can be. Oh, Father, by the power of your Spirit, help your children to stand firm in the apostolic gospel. And may they live in a manner worthy of that apostolic gospel, so that the light of Christ's goodness would shine through them out into the world. We pray especially for Imran and Nagina Gill, our gospel partners. Thank you so much for them. These precious fellow workers who've gone out into the nation of Pakistan for the sake of the name of Christ. Thank you so much, Father, for the news that we've got that their house should be ready very soon and might even be ready as we, we pray to you just now. We ask that you would bless them and their ministries. Thank you for the way that Imran has shown great hospitality in the past, welcoming in Christian brothers that he didn't even know and treating them in a manner worthy of God. Help Imran to continue this powerful ministry of practical hospitality in his new family home. And closer to home here, Father, we thank you so much for our partnership with Hope for Glasgow. Thank you for Terry, Paul, Kate, Susan, and all the other great workers and volunteers who help out in all sorts of different ways. It's such a delight to our hearts to hear the way that so many hopeless people in Glasgow are coming to hear of the sure and certain hope of our Lord Jesus through them. We praise you for the football club that took place over the past week, where some 30 young lads came along every day to hear the truth proclaimed to them. <coughs> Father, we dare to ask that your word would be working powerfully in the hearts and minds of all those young lads, and that those who were already believing in Christ would be built up, and that those who haven't yet surrendered to him would soon do so. And may they join us, your people, and become fellow workers with us as we strive to see your truth advance and advance all over the city. And so, Father, as we come to your same word of truth now, in just a few moments, we ask that you will breathe on our hearts today. Fill the vacuum that enslaves us, the emptiness of heart and soul. And through Jesus Christ who saves us, give us life and make us whole. We want to be a church that's renowned for walking in the truth and for treating one another in a manner worthy of God. Oh Lord, how desperately we need your volcanic spirit to burn within our hearts today, to cleanse and purge us so that we will exhibit holiness in every way. So help us, our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before Terry comes to preach to us, we're going to continue in prayer by singing 525. 525. Wind of God, dynamic spirit, breathe upon our hearts today. 525.
I invite you to take your Bibles and to turn with me again to the letter of 3 John, which you will find in page 1026 of the Pew Bible. 3 John. And as you turn that page up, a brief prayer. Father, we pray that what we know not, you would teach us. What we have not, you would give us. And what we are not, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you would indeed make us. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember a number of years ago, a good friend of mine was, was getting a new bathroom suite uh, fitted in his house. And I phoned him up a, a few days later just, just to ask how, how the work had gone and also to inquire if the plumber that he got in to do the work was any good. As my mother-in-law needed a bathroom suite fitted and you don't want to disappoint your mother-in-law. And my friend said to me, Terry, I wouldn't let that guy anywhere near your mother-in-law's bathroom suite. In fact, I wouldn't let him anywhere near her house. He was an absolute nightmare. And the work he'd done was absolutely shambolic. But my friend went on. There is another plumber, a guy that I had to get in to fix all the shoddy work of the first guy. Now this guy, this guy is excellent. And I would thoroughly recommend and trust him to do the work and any other work that might need him done in the house as well. The first guy, don't let him into the house. The second guy, I thoroughly recommend and and um, recommend this guy. Welcome him and trust him to do the work. Now, friends, I share this story this morning, I hope, as a helpful way into this morning's sermon. The letters of 2 and 3 John are actually letters that, that really go together. Um, and so in order to, to get our bearings, if you would just turn back a page to the letter of 2 John, and I'll, I'll just make some comments to help us get the context. At the heart of 2 John is a letter that the Apostle John wrote from the elder, the Apostle John. And in that letter was a warning, a warning that he gave to ensure that deceivers, false teachers, were recognized by the church. And then having been recognized by the church, they would be rejected and rejected robustly by the church. 2 John verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Don't receive him into your house. Now remember, in those days, the, the church met in houses, house churches. So effectively, don't receive them into your church. So church leaders have a responsibility, not only to preach the truth, but also to protect the church from false teachers and deceivers. And so that means then, friends, that our church leaders have to be very careful about who is given access to the pulpit or any platform to teach in the church. They must give attention to the hymns that we, that we, that we sing when we are gathered together. All hymns are, are full of theology, and some hymns are full of bad theology. It wouldn't be the first time that the preaching of the Word has been totally undermined by the singing of a dodgy hymn immediately following the, ser the sermon. Church leaders must be aware of, of the books and the offers that they promote and what books are, are sold in the, the church book room. They must be very careful about the conferences that they promote. Do not let them into the house. Do not let them into your church. Why? Because they will flood your church, not with water like a dodgy plumber, but with something far, far worse that will have devastating and destructive consequences amongst your congreg congregation. So that's 2 John. But at, what we have in 3 John is instruction and encouragement again from the elder, the Apostle John, to welcome and support genuine Christian workers. 3 John verse 7. For they have gone out for the sake of the name. Verse 8, therefore, we ought to support people like these. And verse 6, and to do so in a manner 
worthy of God. So at the heart of 2 John, recognizing and rejecting the deceivers, while at the heart of 3 John, welcoming and supporting genuine Christian brothers and workers. And as we study this letter together this morning, friends, I suspect that some of us, some of us will be encouraged greatly, encouraged greatly by the practice and the importance of the ordinary. And others amongst us may be greatly challenged, greatly challenged and warned as we are convicted of a mindset, a mindset that is all too common amongst us. The church is full of characters. Three John is, is full of characters, three of them to be exact. The letter revolves around these three men, so I would like to take, take each of them in turn. So firstly, what we have in verses 1 to 8 is Gaius the faithful. Gaius the faithful. John is, is really excited about Gaius, but what is it about Gaius that has got John really excited? Well, it is what others have told him about Gaius. Look with me at verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth. Or as the NIV puts it, it gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me of your faithfulness to the truth. Truth is the, the setting for the whole of the introduction to John's letter. The truth here is the gospel, the faith. So verse 1, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Verse 3 speaks of Gaius' faithfulness to the truth and walking in the truth. And by the time we come to verse 4, it is others who are walking in the truth. Now, as we read these verses, friends, you, you might begin to think that, that John's a, a narrow-minded type obsessed with, with doctrine and creeds. But when we read verse 2, we learn just how rich John's truth is. Verse 2, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. It's such a comprehensive verse, isn't it? Taking in the, the whole of life. As John prays for his dear friend, he prays for the physical, that you may be in good health. He prays for the material, that all may go well with you. I suppose taking in Gaius' work life. And he also prays for his spiritual life, as it goes well with your soul. And friends, I, I think this verse is a, is a great verse to measure our praying by. Don't you agree? We do pray, I'm sure, for people's material, physical needs, but do we ever get to praying for people's souls? That it, that it might go well with, with their souls? Not that the material and the physical don't matter, they do. Our Heavenly Father is interested in these things. But do we ever get to praying for people's souls? Or maybe the challenge of this verse is the exact opposite for you. Maybe you do pray for people's souls, but you never ever get to praying for their physical or material well-being. Well, John here, John here prays for all three, which is, which is right, I'm sure. I'm not going to argue with an apostle. But John knows what, what matters most, doesn't he? Look with me at verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. The children in this verse could be his converts, or it could be that, that John led Gaius to, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or it may be that as he is writing as a pastor to those that, that God has entrusted to his care. But either way, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And this verse, friends, has got to be the, the deepest concern of any minister, I'm sure. The deepest concern of, of any small group leader. And it has to be right, surely, that this is the deepest concern of, of any Christian parent. I have a good friend, and, and she was born to, to Christian parents, a, a fine Christian couple. And her father was a, was a Presbyterian minister. He was a fine, fine, godly man. And my friend, well, she'd obviously been baptized as a baby. But some years later, when she was living away from home, she had come to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And she was going to be baptized by full immersion, the heretic. 
Um, and she tentatively told her father, fearing that what she was about to do um, would upset her father. Her father's response, he sent her a card, and written in the card was 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Friends, whether you're a, whether you're a parent, whether you're a small group leader, whether you're a minister, the concerns are the same, aren't they? But I wonder if you notice that as we move into verses 5 to 8, all the talk that we've had about truth in verses 2 to 4 is now reflected in love, verses 5 to 8. Look at verse 3. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. The testimony that he heard in verse 3 is put this way in verse 6. Who testified to your love before the church. You see, friends, that's why John is confident Gaius is walking in the truth. Because of the love he is showing. And the love he is showing turns out to be all about hospitality. That's what showed Gaius was walking in the truth. In those times, the, the church was dependent on, on traveling teachers. But where would these traveling teachers stay? Well, certainly not the travel lodges of the day, as they were really seedy, really dodgy places. Well, it's obvious then, isn't it? They would stay with the Christians in the places that they were visiting to preach. But friends, this was still a big ask for Gaius and people like him. Because these brothers, verse 5, were also strangers. Gaius had never met them before. The love that he had shown that was reported back to John, verse 6, was love that was shown to strangers who were his Christian brothers. And John explains, verse 7, that they have gone out for the sake of the name, that is, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the total opposite of those from 2 John, verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. These guys in 3 John 7 are genuine Christian brothers. And what we have here is an encouragement to welcome true brothers. See how John finishes off verse 6. And you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Now, what would that look like? Fed, for sure. Watered, I would imagine. Rested, definitely. Helped financially, most probably. Why? Well, verse 7. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles, accepting nothing from the pagans. Not necessarily refusing help from the Gentiles and the pagans, not refusing help, but not looking and expecting them to help you. They were genuine Christian mission, missionaries to be supported by Christian people. Not like the, the other religious teachers of their day who looked to be paid by anyone and everyone who, who listened to, to them. I suppose a wee bit like a, a religious busker being paid by every passerby. People should hear the gospel for free. A Gentile, a pagan, shouldn't pay to hear the gospel. These men have, have gone out for the sake of the name. Therefore, those of us who know the grace of the name, we have an obligation to support the missionary cause. So what did Gaius do to merit a place in the Bible? Well, he, he let missionaries use his spare room. He gave them bed and breakfast. And he gave them a couple of quid to get the bus to the next town. And look what John called it to the end of verse 8. Being a fellow worker for the truth. A friend, maybe, maybe you've heard someone say, or, or maybe you've said it yourself. I can't really do much for, for the gospel. Well, I suppose I, I suppose I could pray. And I suppose, well, I have a little money and I, and I could give that to, to, to the work of the gospel. And maybe, well, maybe the odd time I could, I could have somebody run for dinner or, or somebody run for lunch. Well, friend, the next time you think like that, the next time you feel 
inadequate like that. Remember Gaius, Gaius the faithful. That's what Gaius did. And it was, verse 8, being a fellow worker for the truth. It put Gaius right up there on the front line with the missionaries, sharing in the work. We sang earlier in our service, we all are one in mission. We all are one in call. Our varied gifts united by Christ, the Lord of all. Friends, don't ever forget the power of hospitality. No, everybody can, can be a missionary in a foreign land. But who here, who here can't be hospitable? Do you have a front door, a table? Do you have chairs? Have you got money for a loaf of bread and money for a packet of cold meat? Then if you have, congratulations. You've just qualified to serve in the most ancient of ministries, the ministry of hospitality. And in serving in the ministry of hospitality, you can join the ranks of, of Abraham, who fed not just angels, but the Lord of angels. You can join the ranks of, of Mary and Martha. They opened their house for Jesus, and he in turn opened the grave of their brother Lazarus. You can join the ranks of Zacchaeus, who welcomed Jesus into his house and around his table. Wouldn't you love to be the one who opened their home to Jesus? Wouldn't you? Well, friend, you can be. The Lord Jesus Christ said this, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Friends, as you welcome strangers to your table, you are welcoming God himself. When you open your door to someone, you're sending them this message. You matter to me and you matter to God. You maybe think all that you're saying is, come on, run for a cup of tea. But what is communicated to your guest is this. They are worth the effort. Friends, always remember this. It's not about the spread in the table or the quality of your china or how, how clean even your house is. The thing that matters most is the open door and the shared fellowship. These are the things that, that really matter. Gaius the faithful. But secondly, John moves on. And this character, this character is very different from Gaius. So we have in verses 9 and 10, Diotrephes the fraud. Diotrephes the fraud. Diotrephes is clearly a local church leader. I think maybe he is Gaius's minister. But it does seem a little strange that John would have to write to tell Gaius what is, what is going on in his church. Some have thought maybe Gaius was unwell, explaining John's prayer of verse 2, or that maybe Gaius lived quite a distance away from the church. Well, whatever the reason, there is no denying the problem of Diotrephes. Verse 9, John writes, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes or who loves to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Some have tried to, I suppose, understand and defend Diotrephes' actions here, saying something like this, well, you know, maybe as the time of the living apostles on the earth was, was coming to an end, most probably at the time in, of the writing of 3 John, um, the apostle John was the only living apostle. Some have said, well, you know, maybe as the, the time of the living apostles here on the earth was coming to an end, maybe Diotrephes was, was just trying to get ready for that time, that period, when the apostles would no longer be around. And so he was going alone in independency. Well, friends, an independency that will have nothing to do with the apostles' ministry is a very dangerous independency. Don't you agree? John goes on, verse 10. Not only does he blank the apostle John, but he also badmouths the apostle, verse 10. So if I come, I will bring up, I will make public what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, gossiping maliciously about us. Presumably, Diotrephes was doing this because he wanted others to reject John as well and to look to him instead. And not content with that, verse 10, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He resents their intrusion onto his patch. 
And he also stops. He blocks those who want to welcome the brothers. And he puts them, he boots them out of the church. He blanks and badmouths the apostle John. He blanks the brothers. He blocks others from welcoming the brothers. And he boots them out of the church if they dare to welcome the brothers. It's absolutely terrifying. Absolutely terrifying to think that a church leader would behave like this. There is no theological issue with, with John or with the brothers. But behind it all is this wee phrase that appears in verse 9. Diotrephes, who likes or who loves to put himself first. No doctrinal heresy is mentioned. None of the dangers that we were warned of in 2 John, welcoming and, and endorsing um, deceivers. No, no. Here there is just no welcoming and endorsing of true believers at all. Because Diotrephes loves to be first. Not that there's anything unusual about this. This is just human nature in the raw, isn't it? Loving to be first. I know that's me in my more sinful moments. That's certainly true of me, especially around about dinner time. Serve me first. Diotrephes loves to be first. And friends, when you get that in leadership, you have a leader who must be the center. He must have the spotlight and he must call the shots. And friends, I'm afraid to say it's all too common. And ultimately, loving to be first is the sin of Satan. Isaiah 14, verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will make myself like the Most High. The sin of Satan. Also the sin of the teachers of the law, whom the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked so strongly. Beware of the scribes, said the Lord Jesus Christ, who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Friends, to love to be first guarantees massive insecurities in the leader insecurities that will be there in your life and in your ministry, always feeling constantly under threat, under threat that somebody's going to come along and take my place from me. Insecurity within leadership is, is damaging. And not just within leadership within a church, but also leadership within a small group, even leadership in a family. To love to be first, stops me from ever reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ, who told the apostles, didn't he? You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, friends, Diotrephes didn't just want to be on stage and center. He didn't want anyone else on the stage with him. Our good friend David Jackman writes in his commentary, the Holy Spirit gets drummed out of office in churches where Diotrephes rules. Why? Because Diotrephes is first. It is no longer the Lord Jesus Christ who is first. No longer the Lord Jesus Christ having preeminence, as the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1. Again from David Jackman. Churches in the pocket of one person or one family dynasty where nothing can happen without the approval of Mr. X because it's his church. So if I come, says John, if I come, yes, John, if you come, what will you do, John? Well, if I come, says John, I will make public. I will bring up what he is doing. What? Is that, is that it, John? Is that all, all you're going to do, John? Are you not going to give him the boot the way he's been giving the boot to others? No, says John. I will bring up what he is doing. I don't know about you, friends, but this all just sounds rather weak 
and feeble to me. But it may not be so weak and feeble as it sounds. John is not getting involved in a war of words. He is not prepared to sink to the same level of, of diatrophies in his wicked talk. No. But for Gaius and any others who, who make up the oppressed minority, there is plenty of encouragement here. That may well be the reason that this paragraph has been written, in order for Gaius um, to show his other friends in the church, in order to assure them that the apostle John knows all that is going on, he knows what is happening, and he will do something about it. He will come, and he will expose Diotrephes for the fraud of a Christian leader that he is. Gaius the faithful, Diotrephes the fraud, and thirdly, in verses 11 and 12, Demetrius, the challenge. Demetrius, the challenge. Verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. John knows that we all have, have role models or, or mentors that we will imitate. Well, says John, make sure you choose your role models carefully. I think it's clear that that going on from verses 9 and 10, Diotrephes is the evil not to be copied. Well, given of what we know of him, why would anyone want to copy Diotrephes? Well, remember, Diotrephes is the local church leader, and he is the nearest role model. And if verse 10 is right, then I would imagine that Gaius is due a pastoral visit pretty soon, a visit that I would presume would put plenty of pressure on Gaius, to stop the generous ministry of hospitality that he's been ex 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 exercising. Whoever does good is from God, John goes on in verse 10. And as you chose those to model, remember this, to be God's will show itself in goodness, or to put it the other way around, whoever does evil has not seen God. If there is no godly character, then you can be sure there is no experience of the living God. I think we all know what John means by has not seen God. Je John is very clear that, that no one has seen God. He has written it twice before. Once in his gospel in John chapter 1 verse 18, no one has seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He, that is Jesus. Jesus makes the Father known. And the second time he writes it is in his first letter. Just turn back just a page or two to 1 John chapter 4 and to, to verse 7. <coughs> the Apostle John writes, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. These verses parallel are, are verses in 3 John. Here they speak of love. In 3 John, it's good and evil. But let's continue in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And friends, here's our point, verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, then we can see God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. You see, with Diotrephes and his followers, there's no loving one another. There is no love for the Apostle John, no love for those who have gone out for the sake of the name, and certainly no love for those that would dare to welcome them. So you won't see God in Diotrephes' church. He is not the model to imitate Gaius. Demetrius, Demetrius is the model to follow Gaius. Demetrius is almost certainly the carrier of this letter, and he comes highly recommended, verse 12. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone. Everyone speaks well of him, and from the truth itself. 
If the truth could speak, it would vouch for him. Even if Diotrephes disapproves. And we also add our testimony. And you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius is the model to imitate. That is the testimony to have, Gaius. Do you want that testimony about you, Gaius, John is saying? Then keep on doing what you are doing. Keep on welcoming the brothers and showing them hospitality. Don't let Diotrephes or anyone else for that matter pressure you into having a testimony that doesn't match Demetrius. Well, that's good for Gaius. But what about us, us here at the Tron? We've come here this morning to learn and to be instructed in the things of the faith. And we're being asked about how we use our homes. Well, yes, friends, that's the challenge of Free John. The challenge to be a, a Christian community, a love one another community. And just like Gaius, it will involve strangers who are brothers and sisters in Christ. It will include our spare room, our spare bed, our spare cash, and our spare time. And all of these things will face me square on with the challenge, who will I imitate? Will I imitate Diotrephes or will I imitate Demetrius? Will I imitate good or will I imitate evil? Will I put the gospel and others first or will I continue to love being first myself? And all of these things, all of these things will determine if we here at the Tron are to be a people, a community, where the living God can be discovered and experienced. The church is full of characters. What kind of character will you be? Let us pray together. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Our loving Heavenly Father, we have learned that this walking in the truth can never be separated from loving the brothers. So help us, Father, as a fellowship to welcome others gladly, just as you have welcomed us. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his glory alone. Amen. Well, to close our service this morning, friends, we again will take our blue hymn books and we will turn to number 866. 866. Just glance at verse 4. With him we serve, his work we share, with saints everywhere, near and far, one in the task which faith requires, one in the zeal which, which never tires, one in the hope his love inspires. Coming, Lord.
We finished a wee bit early this morning, but if you have children down in the, uh, the various Sunday schools, please don't go down to get them until quarter past um, 12. You'll be glad of the 10 minutes. Till at the last with joy we'll see Jesus in glorious majesty. Live with him through eternity, reigning Lord. And until that day dawns, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit the Comforter be with us all and those whom we love, both now and forevermore. Amen.